I'll be calling on Professor De Smit from Leuven, who will join me as chair of the next controversy. And uh, this is also a very interesting one, and that is on pretreatment in non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes. And Dr. Marco Valgimili will give the proposition. Ah, there he is. <laughs> I didn't see you. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Franz Josef, Walter, Manel. Privileged to be here. I would like to have the remote. Ah, it's here. Perfect. Okay. So the topic that we are discussing, whether to start oral B12 inhibitor as early as possible, or whether should we wait to get the patient into the cath lab, look at the anatomy, and then based upon what we see, shall we start this treatment, yes or no? These are my conflict of interest, which I think and hope will, in fact, not affect uh, my uh, discussion. So to set the stage, and perhaps to uh, put the borders with respect to what topics I would like to uh, debate, I'm not, of course, uh, in an unconditional manner in favor of starting this treatment, whatever treatment I was speaking about, as early as possible. And I think the evidence in favor or disfavor of early initiation of P2Y12 inhibitor in non ST segment elevation SES, that's what I would like to restrict myself today, is in a way conclusive for one of the drugs which is available, which is uh, Prasugar, if anything, because we have a clear dedicated studies with very clear results, whereas it's not entirely clear with respect to Culpidogrel and Ticagro. However, I guess in this room, many of us, if not probably the majority of us, are clinicians, which means we need to decide every day when to give this drug. We cannot simply say, I don't have enough evidence. And so we need to use the best possible evidence. And my understanding and my reading of the evidence is that the best possible evidence would suggest early initiation for either Clopidogrel or Ticagro, and that's actually the position I would like uh, to defend. <clears throat> I guess speaking in 2020 about clopid pretreatment, yes or no, I need to attack immediately and kick off with the so-called elephant in the room, which is basically the element that probably needs uh, at most to be discussed. And this is the core study in my view, not really because the results are not clear, the results are extremely clear, but in fact the way you may interpret the study, it's probably different. And I guess Manel will try to uh, let us know that this is the only dedicated <coughs> study to repeat treatment. It overrules all prior evidence. I am on the other side of the elephant, of course. I was putting myself in the lady condition, so I was kind uh, to Manel. And actually, I think that the study is indeed very conclusive with respect to the drug which has been tested. The trick here is simply not to take the evidence with respect to Prasugra and pretend they do apply whatsoever to other drugs which were not simply tested in the study. So my position is very clear. And now I would like to gauge also your position with respect to the oral P2Y12 inhibitors. And by a show of hands, I would like you to either take the option A position or the option B position. Option A position is Clopidogrel, Prasugra, and Ticagro are three identical animals. Option B is Clopidogre, Prasugre, and Ticagro are uh, three uh, different animals belonging to the same species. So who is in favor of option A by show of hand? Okay, nobody? Who is in favor of option B by show of hands? Okay, that was easy, Manel. I think I already won the debate. <laughs> because in fact, I do agree with you. I do agree with you. We do have head-to-head -head comparison, which I will be discussing later on. But I guess the best job here to try to support with data the position that we all, in a way, embraced, meaning Prasugra and Ticagra and Clopidogra are different animals, is actually coming from the head-to-head -head indirect comparison that we can have by putting Plato and Triton together. Of course, Plato compared Tecagro versus Clopidogre, uh, Triton, Prasugre versus Clopidogre. If we use the control group, we can, in a way, uh, understand the effect of either the true treatment by normalizing the treatment effect by the control group. And that's more or less what I did here, which is a, perhaps, if you will, a very simple layman network meta-analysis. But the message I would like to give here is that if you look at the primary point, 
The effect of either of the two drugs with respect to uh, clopidogrel is pretty much alike. If you look at the absolute excess of spontaneous bleeding event, it's identical. It's 0.6% for both. If you look at mortality, we have been discussing this topic for, for ages. It's significant in one study. There is a trend which is not reaching the statistical significant threshold in another study. At the end of the day, I guess the data are pretty much alike. But if there is one thing which is really standing out on this indirect comparison, which I personally believe is real, it's really the risk associated to the surgical bleeding, so the surgical bleeding risk, to better say. Because in one study, as you see here, uh, I cannot point because otherwise you will not see, but in one study in Triton, there was an excess of 10 absolute risk in this favor of Prasic with the number needed to treat for arm of 10. In the other study, there was actually no excess. It was a slightly benefit even with the number needed to treat for benefit in the range of 200. So I guess this equation needs to be taken into with some consideration, because again, it's an indirect comparison, but you really see a completely different signal. Now, having seen this indirect comparison, I would like to <coughs> reanalyze with you the coast data, and in a way discuss with you why I personally believe it cannot be applied to other drugs apart from prasugrel. Now, if you do an exercise which everybody can do, just go in the supplementary appendix and tease out where this extra bleeding risk is coming from in patients having received the drug early as compared to those who got the drug only in the cath lab. And you see that 20% of the extra risk in fact, it's coming in medically managed patients. This is probably not very relevant to be discussed, because Prasuga is not indicated in this segment of patients, so we can forget about this 20%. 40% of the extra risk in terms of bleeding related to CABG is coming from surgery, which is probably not very surprising if you take into account the data that we have seen uh, before. And then you have still 40% of uh, extra bleeding risk coming from patients who actually underwent PCI. Now, in fact, if you carefully look into the sources of this PCI-related <coughs> extra bleeding complication, there were either an extra number of pericardial bleeding, which to me, at least to the best of my possible interpretation, speaks for a bad luck. I don't think Prasugar, given early on, will expose patient to pericardial tamponade. It's probably just a chance finding. On the other side, probably something which is real is that there was an excess of femoral-related bleeding complication. So this plot to me means that if you are sticking to Ticagro where you don't have this 40% of extra bleeding complication, and at the same time you are sticking to the radial more than the femoral artery while accessing patient during the invasive management, probably the early administration of P212 inhibitor would not be associated to any extra bleeding risk. Now, the other mystery, in a way, perhaps even more interesting finding of a cause is that early administration of Prasuga did not produce any ischemic benefit. And why is that the case? It's for me very difficult to be explained. I don't have personal access to the database, so I cannot torture the database until it will confess. The only thing I can do here is to, in a way, contrast how the study was conceived and planned with respect to how the study was executed. And in fact, if you look at the protocol, page 42, which is public domain in the New England Journal of Medicine website, what you would see that even Gilles Montalisco himself and the ACOS group was expecting a much greater delay from randomization and administration of the treatment to PCI. And they were speaking of an expected median delay of 12 hours. Well, the actual delay they actually saw in the study was 4.3 hours delay. Now, key question, did this short delay play the role? I cannot tell you, perhaps yes, perhaps no. But next question for you and for us to address, is this 4.3% delay in a way representative of our practice? And the answer is yes, if we look into randomized controlled clinical trials. Here you see a bunch of studies actually investigating more or less the non stemmy population with respect to the time to invasive <coughs> coronary angiography. And what you see that over time, the time to angio is reduced, uh, progressively reduced over time. However, be very careful because this is an artificial picture coming from the randomized studies. If at the same time you scrutinize the registries, which are in my mind more carefully capturing the reality of our practice. Our practice has absolutely not changed in the last year. And in fact, in many situations, 
even in my institution where we claim we are immediately taking the non stemi patient to the cath lab, the delay is not one to three hours. The true delay is much more uh, longer. And if you not just restrict the focus into the selected number of patients getting to studies, but you look at the totality of non stemi patients, that's what we do when you look at registries, the picture is not a delay of 4.3 hours. And why is this relevant? Well, perhaps if, because if you give the time to the drug to act, kick in, and do what it's supposed to do, probably a pharmacological effect would be clear. This is a small study, probably not convincing everybody, but at least it's going in the direction I would have expected. This is a comparison of take agro upstream, and upstream means an average pretreatment duration of more or less 12, 13 hours, which is not that long. It's probably even shorter than what we see in our practice, as compared to prasuga given in the cath lab. Small study, carefully done, and what you see here that if you look at the rate of periprocedural myocardial infraction, there is a clear signal telling us what is absolutely known and obvious, that having the P2Y12 pathway inhibited at the time of PCI does bring value with respect to the lower risk for periprocedural myocardial infarction. What about the evidence outside Prasugar? Well, I think the father of the evidence is this study, is the CURE study. First, this is a landmark study because it actually got market approval for the drug. And I guess this study, like any, uh, any other studies afterwards, really showed the value of pretreatment. In reality, CURE is a complicated study because in a setting of over 10,000 non-STEMI patients, they were exposed to either early administration of clopidogrel versus placebo, then if the treating physician was deciding to bring them to the cath lab and do a PCI, then of course those who underwent PCI had to stick to a DPT regimen for at least 30 days, and then in the experimental arm, only in the experimental arm, clopidogrel had to be continued up to uh, one year. So in a way I'm telling you this because if we just look at the overall study result of cure, it's a combination of pre and post treatment. Early exposure as well as continuation of exposure after the conventional 30 day of DPT. But if we focus on PCI patients only and we cut the follow up at uh, 30 days, by definition we are only looking into the value of giving clopidogrel upstream as compared to placebo. Then at the time of PCI, all patients by study design had to be on open label clopidogrel. So at the end of the day, they focus only on early administration of the drug. And the results of this uh, gesture is very simple. There is a huge benefit in this study. So an action which is taking place here early on, before time zero, is associated to a 44% risk reduction of the primary endpoint, which is twice as big as what we saw in the overall study. So in a way, we are already seeing that giving the drug early is perhaps more making sense as to continue the drug later on. And what is fascinating that a gesture of ear anticipating basically the treatment here means a treatment benefit which seems to accrue over time. Now, in this specific moment of time, we can discuss what periprocedural MI means. There is a hot debate. I don't want to go there, but I would simply would like to tell you that the benefit in the study was before the patient were entering to the lab as well as during PCI, so the periprocedural MI risks. And without spending time discussing what definition of periprocedural MI was in the study, just look into the Q-wave MI. This is a giant MI with clear prognostic implication, and it was a 65% risk reduction. Many say cure should not be discussed. Gilles would have said that. I don't know whether Manel will go there, but say cure should not be discussed because it's an outdated study where patients were waiting uh, years before getting into the cath lab. Where years is not true, but in fact the median time from randomization to, to, to catheterization was six days, so it's quite a long uh, delay. But for cure, we have also an interesting sub-analysis, which is here, where we have, they have, I was not involved here, they have stratified, sorry, I pushed the wrong button, they have stratified the delay from administration of the drug to uh, invasive management. And actually, what you see here, formally speaking, there is a consistent benefit. So the time from randomization to uh, invasive management does not interfere with the treatment effect, which is there irrespective. But if you want to force the evidence, actually, in those in whom uh, the invasive management took place in a way in a, uh, in a contemporary manner. Within two days after hospital admission, the benefit was at least numerically greater. And that is something you can actually derive from yourself. Again, go in the supplementary appendix of the original publication. 
And what you see here in the New England Journal of Medicine website, that even if you restrict the analysis to 24 hours, there are clear signal of benefit and actually don't see any harm because there was no extra bleeding uh, complication within the first day from randomization. Another argument of discussion I would like to quickly bring in is why should you wait? If the benefit is restricted to PCI patient only, then it would make sense. But if the benefit is irrespective of the final revascularization strategy or whether the patient is or is not invasively managed, then why should you wait? And that is the message coming from CURE. The benefit is consistent uh, throughout. And in a way, the same message is coming from Plato. Plato did not reinvent the wheel. Plato they simply used the CURE study design and instead put the winning arm of cure in the control group and put Ticagra in the experimental arm. So it was early administration of Ticagra as compared to early administration of Corpidogra. And in a way, the study has shown exactly the same finding. The benefit is completely consistent throughout. This is not periprocedure MI. I would like to tell you that this is a mortality, overall mortality benefit. And in fact, numerically speaking, the greatest benefit in it are in those who underwent coronary artery bypass grafting. And again, why? you should wait. The benefit in terms of mortality is extremely front-loaded. And then what about the safety of uh, uh, Ticagra? Ty well, here, of course, we have some limitation because the counter group is not perceived, but the counter group is clopidogrel. The only thing I can tell you that if you look at the non stemi population, you see that the curves are identity, so there is no extra bleeding risk of giving Ticagra upstream as compared to uh, clopidogrel uh, upstream. Now, the last point I would like to tackle, and then I will try to go to the conclusion, is that be careful, because if we change our practice, and we have been pre-treating patients for years, now apparently we have changed our mind because of a cost, there are a lot of things that probably needs to be rediscussed, and one of those is time to invasive coronary angiography in this patient population. Timax, many years ago, 2009, told us that you don't need to rush all this patient in, into the cath lab unless the grade score is uh, greater than 140. In all the others, it's even opposite trend. So you can take two, three days, it's not a problem. So our practice, in a way, justified and justifiable. More recently, verdict absolutely showed the same thing. Only those in whom the grace risk score is high should be uh, intervened upon uh, early. And early means within 24 hours in Timax, within 12 hours in a verdict. Be very careful, because all patients were pretreated across these two studies. What is the equation with respect to delay to uh, invasive management if no OP treatment is in place? Nobody knows for real. I would like simply to show this uh, French study. Not a huge study. I don't think it will convince everybody, but I would probably uh, submit to you that it may raise some doubt in your mind. This is the so-called early investigation. Uh, more than 700 non-STEMI patients, high risk, randomized within two hours to invasive management or delayed. And look at the difference. It's 4.4 in the early, 21 extra percent in the delayed, and importantly in the study, unlike the previous one, no pretreatment was allowed. So key question for us to think about, would absence of pretreatment force us four o'clock overnight to wake up and do the angiogram in our non-STEMI? Well, maybe. I skipped this one, I guess we can go there in the discussion. And let me simply conclude that my position is perfectly summarized in the currently available uh, guidelines, 20 ESC and 2019. Our culture person was the chairperson of these revascularization guidelines, where basically the statement is pretreatment with the P212 inhibitor is generally recommended in patient whom anatomy is known and the decision to proceed to PCI is made, 1A. In patient with non stemi undergoing invasive management, Ticagra administration of clopidogrel, if Ticagra is not an option, should be considered as soon as possible. 2A, C, we honestly should say we have no clear evidence, but that's probably very reasonable to do, and fine, Prasagra is not an option in the upstream setting. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, I, it's now my pleasure to introduce Manel Sabata from Barcelona, and he will take the opposite position that we don't need pretreatment. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, Marco, and the chairman, and uh, also the, the chair of the Congress for the invitation. But as you can see, this is not uh, Manuel Sabaté, it's Gilles Montelesco, who is here now. I have to apologize because you know that uh, he had a family problem. 
and who, who did not uh, attend uh, this meeting. But uh, he was so kind to send yesterday his slides. And I will try to reflect uh, uh, his arguments to, uh, against the, the statement. The statement that uh, he said that P2Y12 inhibi inhibition should be st started at the time of non STEMI diagnosis. And his idea, and I concur with his argument, you will see in a minute, is that this is, uh, the answer is no. The definition of pretreatment is stated here is uh, something that you give to the patient uh, before or either in the ambulance, in the emergency department, in the coronary care unit, or in the cath lab prior to the visualization of the coronary anatomy. This concept, as uh, Marco just mentioned, born uh, almost 20 years ago. And this was uh, the CURE trial. And, and, and you can see with the presentation that uh, Marco said before and the presentation I'm going to, 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 to show here is that the evidence is really as scarce in this, in this context. That's why we are here discussing when to start with uh, 2B3A, uh, 2B2, uh, Y12 uh, in the inhibitors in, the, uh, in this context. In the CURE trial, this was a trial performed in patients suffering from AQ coronary syndrome. This was a randomized trial comparing clopidogrel and placebo at that time, starting early uh, in the late 90s and published early 2000. And uh, you, can, uh, you have to, to, see, uh, to see here that uh, the, there was a clear benefit of clopidogrel as compared to placebo regarding the primary endpoint of a composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or a stroke. But this has, uh, was performed in centers in which uh, the early use of invasive procedure was not the norm. Uh, they randomized 12,000 people. And as mentioned, that the, the mean time waiting for a catheterization was 10 days. Uh, more than 50% of the patient did not receive any uh, uh, invasive uh, assessment, and just 20% of the patients receive finally intervention, percutaneous coronary intervention. So the, this end up with 2,000 patients involved in the sub study, the PCI cure, uh, that was of course uh, uh, not power enough to demonstrate difference in the in clinical events, and was a clear reduction in in terms of cardiovascular death and my energy and revascularization in favoring clopidogrel as compared to placebo. Of course, pretreatment, uh, almost all patients receive pretreatment because uh, they have waiting for 10 days, even 46 days uh, at the, for, for, a, for a catheterization. And uh, none, none of them, uh, of course, receive uh, a post uh, or a treatment after, after PCA, PCI. And as mentioned by Marco, those patients who receive a stent require a dual antipathetic therapy with clopidogrel for one month after the procedure. Uh, so it was a pretreatment, a placebo against clopidogrel, then the stent in 20% of the patients and with clopidogrel and, 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 uh, in both arms, and then again uh, pro, uh, clopidogrel or placebo during the, the follow-up up to nine months. Uh, but uh, there were other trials with clopidogrel, and this concept of pretreatment was invalidated when a specific trial was performed in the, uh, for pretreatment. And it was a case for Credo, Credo involving uh, ACS patients in 67% of the cases. Uh, comparing pretreatment with clopidogrel or no pretreatment, there were not benefits in terms of uh, ischemic events. And there was also uh, not con no concerns in terms of uh, safety events. In terms of major bleeding, was a numerical increase in major bleeding if, uh, uh, against uh, pretreatment with clopidogrel. But also PRAC-8 was also uh, a, a trial comparing pretreatment with uh, no pretreatment uh, with clopidogrel, showed no benefit in terms of ischemic events, but show a harm uh, and increase safety concerns in patients receiving pretreatment with uh, clopidogrel. This was at seven days, all timid bleeding uh, uh, as an endpoint. And as mentioned by Marco, this concept was also invalidated with prasugrel, and the ACOS trial, already discussed, uh, demonstrated that pretreatment with prasugrel 
uh, increased bleedings without affecting the, the, uh, the uh, ischemic events. There were patients with high risk non stemi uh, uh, events, uh, troponin uh, increased, one randomized one to one to prasugrel, half dose, 30 milligrams before the angiography and placebo, and then complete the, 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 the prasugrel with 30 milligrams after the angiography prior to PCI, or giving prasugrel 60 milligrams at the time of the PCI. And the primary endpoint was this combined endpoint of death, stroke, MI, urgent revask, 2B3 inhibitors by allowed at seven days. And no difference in, in terms of ischemic events, and uh, as discussed before, was uh, an increase in all TIM major bleeding. The discussion of whether this is related to access, femoral access, cabbage, etc., is there, and I concur with Marco's comments. And it's difficult to, to really understand why these 30 milligrams may increase such an uh, amount of events. But at least there's no clear uh, um, in benefit in terms of ischemic events by giving prasugrel before the, the, the visualization of the anatomy. So what's true is that uh, the risk of waiting uh, is there, uh, but uh, in this, at least in a cause, was not a difference in terms of waiting for the, in patients with pretreatment of, or no treatment, the risk of ischemic events was no different. And also in this analysis, uh, uh, in dividing by different hours, either early hours, less than 2.5 hours, between 2.5 and 4 hours, or more than four hours and up to more than 13 hours, there's no difference in terms of uh, uh, events occurring in patients uh, receiving pretreatment or not pretreatment. So there's not clear risk of waiting, at least in this analysis coming from this, this trial. And when you put together the three trials, the CREDO, the PRAC-8, and the ACOST, there's no uh, clear uh, benefit in terms of ischemic events and there's also, there is a, a, a risk of uh, uh, hemorrhagic events, or bleeding events, at least in PRAC-8 and a ghost. And this was uh, when put together this meta-analysis with the three trials, uh, you don't see any benefit in terms of ischemic events, and then you see major bleeding uh, increase in patients receiving uh, pretreatment. So apparently no pretreatment is better regarding these, uh, these bleeding events. In real life, and this data from a registry uh, performed here in, in, in Spain, uh, comparing a STEMI and non-STEMI, that could be a different story. STEMI patients with really highly thrombotic lesions, uh, in this case, in this uh, analysis, uh, it was a benefit of pretreatment. And this is what we, we currently do in, in, in everyday practice. All patients coming from a STEMI uh, are pretreated with clopidogrel, uh, prasugrel, uh, or ticagrelor. But in the non-STEMI cases, in non-STEMI patients, there was not clear uh, benefit of pretreatment in this real-life uh, experience, real-life registry. Another meta-analysis that was performed by uh, my colleague, uh, Marco, is one of the co-authors, showing that uh, the, the, the clopidogrel pretreatment in acute coronary syndrome is clear that uh, in ACS currently we are using prasugrel and ticagrelor, not clopidogrel. Uh, in this meta-analysis was PCI patients only. There was post hoc analysis in mono, most of the studies. A mixing of STEMI and non-STEMI uh, patients uh, many patients coming from registries, then uh, you know that in a registry there, there, will, uh, there, there, will be, uh, there can be multiple biases. And uh, when you have no pretreatment with no loading, in some studies that happen in some studies, that could be tra uh, translated in no treatment at all. And this, of course, is uh, uh, impairing this, this arm in this meta-analysis. But in any case, again, STEMI patients showed a benefit in terms of pretreatment with uh, clopidogrel, but in non-STEMI patients, this benefit was not uh, that clear. There was also uh, an, an, uh, an a study showing, discussing the, this fact that basically this pretreatment can be or should be uh, more demonstrated or was more demonstrated in STEMI, but clearly non-STEMI, at least 
or when this, there is expected delay longer than 24, uh, 48 hours, or the patient has low bleeding risk, or is really a high risk as non-STEMI, that could be the ideal candidate for, uh, for pertinent with uh, uh, P2Y12 inhibitors, but for the other patients maybe it's not necessary while you are increasing the risk of, of bleeding. And what about ticarelor? Basically, this has not been tested in ticarelor, the concept of pretreatment versus no pretreatment. And cangrelor uh, also is another uh, very interesting uh, uh, agent that uh, could avoid all this history <laughs> of the pretreatment in the future. Uh, we know data from Plato showing the benefit when comparing ticarelor pretreatment with clopidogrel pretreatment, but not ticarelor pretreatment versus ticarelor no pretreatment showing this benefit in terms of ischemic and uh, some, again, some risk of uh, increasing bleeding events, that was clear. But uh, when you go to ISAR react this is a trial, of course, not comparing pretreatment with no pretreatment, but we can infer some data from the non-STEMI uh, group of patients. Uh, you know that this is a, a, comp a comparison between Prasugrel versus Ticagrelor. In non-STEMI patients, the uh, ticarol was given at the time of randomization before the angiography, as, uh, as in Plato, so following the, the classical pretreatment in this case. And Prasugrel was given after visualization of the angiography at the time of the PCI. So a sort of comparison of pretreatment with ticarol versus uh, uh, post-treatment with uh, Prasugrel. And in non-STEMI patients, there were no difference in terms of uh, in, in whatsoever, but it probably is, 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 not, is not significantly different, but the number of events was even better in patients receiving prasugrel in whom there was no pretreatment with prasugrel, was just uh, given at the time of the PCI. But even in this situation, when you are giving ticagrelor, a potent uh, P2Y12 inhibitor before uh, the visualization as a pretreatment. In this trial, there was not any benefit as compared to Prasugel given post hoc or after visualization of the, of the anatomy of the patient. So the debate is in the guidelines, and you can see different options in different guidelines as soon as possible. A pretreatment with Prasugel is not, when it's not known, it's not recommended. Uh, pretreatment with clopidogrel is not recommended in a stable patients, etc. So there is still room for uh, research in this in this area because there's not clear trial that really assess or compare this situation. Uh, so the idea is just to, to apply the evidence and use the right options. There, there are other options that may increase the uh, uh, the bioavailability of the, uh, the drugs in the, in, the, in the patient, and there's a crash, chewed, or dispersible uh, agents, uh, Ticaro or Praswell, that may increase this availability in, the, in blood and may improve the outcomes. And also the IV agent, the, uh, the uh, Cangrelor, that of course may avoid all this story of give uh, uh, this pretreatment three days before waiting for the for the, uh, for the PCI and increasing the risk of the, the bleeding events. So the conclusions of Gil Montalesco are here. The pretreatment, of course, increased the bleeding risk. The ischemic risk, however, is not reduced with pretreatment. There's no mortality effect with pretreatment, so we are not really improving anything. So the idea, uh, his idea, and I concur with this idea, is look first at coronaries and treat selectively and do not treat routinely the patients to watch complications. You can start only in patients who, when it's justified, of if a patient has to have a long wait, more than 24 hours waiting for a catheterization, or in patients with me, that you, your option is just to keep on medical uh, therapy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, if we try to keep to the schedule of this meeting. We'll, we'll have only time for one or two questions at this uh, moment. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? May I ask one question to, to both of you? Um, 
Could it be that the timing plays a crucial role? So, so if, if there is a very short time to go into the cath lab, you have little <laughs> advantage from pretreatment because you wouldn't have the full effect. But on the other hand, and, and this maybe drives the results in trials such as uh, the ISA React 5, But on the other hand, if you have a longer wait, like several hours, then you have an advantage of, of the pretreatment because you have the full effect of the pretreatment and you have the time for the wait where, where the patient is at risk. I, in my view, the non STEMI is so heterogeneous that makes that it is difficult to demonstrate uh, benefit or not benefit. You, you can find patients with the diffuse disease Uh, candidates for cabbage, you may have patients with no lesions, uh, with just uh, microvascular obstructions, you can have patients with a single spot uh, lesion with, uh, treated with just one single stent. You know, that is current practice. That's why uh, uh, probably the, the, the evidence or, or, or is not that, not that clear. In the STEM, it's clear that the pathophysiology of the STEMI is most, most of them the same, have thrombotic occlusion, and then it's clear that as soon uh, as early as possible is, I think, is the best option. For foreign STEMI, when you have this bunch of possibilities, then maybe you are waiting in a patient 550 kilos, waiting for three days for a catheterization with no lesion that has a bleeding complication because he's a, a small lady with, uh, or you are in, in a high risk patient Uh, that, uh, of course, if you wait three, three days, the patient is, uh, has uh, repeated ischemic events and then is a high risk. So probably it's a combination of several factors in this, in this heterogeneous uh, scenario. I, I think so, Franz Joseph. I think it's a matter of, uh, I think it's a, the benefit is a function of how much uh, long the pretreatment is going to be. If it's going to be short, To be honest, the pills are going to be in the stomach and they, they are hardly kicking in. So I don't really see the risks. They would not justify the potential risk of giving the pill to a wrong patient or a right patient with a diagnosis who has to undergo coronary artery bypass grafting. So that's why my position is completely complementary to what Gilles normally says. Gilles says in STEMI pretreat them all, in non STEMI do not pretreat. I would do completely the opposite if I could choose. Because in STEMI, you don't have time to make a proper diagnosis. It's true that at the end, PCI is 99%, but it's also true that from time to time, you have an artery dissection, you have something else, and at the end of the day, you are sticking the stent in the patient while the pills are still here, even the agroprasover. In non-STEMI, you have time to evaluate the patient. If the patient is incredibly high risk, of course, you don't pretreat. But it's an average non-STEMI. Why should the patient stay 14 days waiting for the angiogram on aspirin. I think it would make sense to give uh, to be three individuals before. So I think you are completely right. It's not the STEMI versus non-STEMI. It's the time to intervention. It, when you have this non-STEMI, where you have ST7 depression everywhere, these are worse than STEMI. This patient you should perhaps even send to, to CABG because they have occluded the left main or whatever. So in this patient, I would never treat them, even in non-STEMI. But if the patient is a stable patient who can wait, the diagnosis is clear, I don't see the reason why you should wait. Thank you, uh, speakers of the session. Thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, holding out. And uh, now you have deserved a coffee, I understand. <laughs>